Well, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark Skidmore. I am the uh, uh, the director of the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development, and um, I'm happy to introduce today's seminar. Um, before we do that, I just want to um, introduce the this uh, entire webinar series called Community Impacts of Energy Development. And so the first uh, of, of three webinars, are, are actually four webinars, are, are um, um, discussed and um, over the next um, couple of months, several months. And so you can see them listed right here on the Adobe Connect uh, uh, page here. Um, and the first um, webinar is um, in that we're giving today is entitled Synergies and Innovations in Coordinating Energy Impacts Research, the case of shale development impacts. And um, the three researchers working on this project are um, Jeffrey Jaquette. I hope I've said that correctly, Jeff. You just told me a moment ago. Jeremy Weber and Julia Haggerty. Um, so I'm really um, glad to. Um, be able to participate and, and help with this webinar series. And I'm really looking forward um, to the presentations, and in particular, the presentation today. So I will um, pass it on to the presenters, and um, we'll get started. So thanks again. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, this is Jeffrey Jaquette, um, assistant professor. Um, in the School of Environment and Natural Resources at Ohio State University. Uh, just to introduce the project a little bit more, so this is part of a NSF-funded uh, research coordination network, which is sort of morphed into the name uh, Energy Impacts. We have a website, um, energyimpacts.org, where you will be able to view uh, this webinar and um, all the following webinars in uh, YouTube formats. And there's a bunch of other um, Fun things at that website as well. So we have a um, we're, we're, we have a social science and energy research directory that you can sign up for. You can actually search for researchers who are doing social science research on energy development. I think we have about 115 or 20 researchers in that directory right now. Uh, if you do social science research on energy, you can sign up and uh, create your own profile. Uh, with as little or as much information as you would like. Uh, there's a mapping feature, so you can map um, people based on where they are or uh, where they do their research uh, across all different types of energy. And you can also search by the energy type, uh, so check that out. And then also, uh, this uh, RCN, the Research Coordination Network, is in some ways culminating in this uh, symposium that we're planning. Uh, it's going to be held July 26th and 27th in 2017 here uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and there's a lot more information there. Uh, we're accepting abstracts at this time, uh, which I think are open until mid-February. Um, very excited about that, even though it's still a ways off. Um, uh, you know, as the plans come together, we're very much excited. And that also sort of coincides a couple days before the uh, Rural Sociological Society meetings, which are happening uh, in Columbus as well. <coughs> uh, so just to discuss what we're going to talk about today. So the idea here is that we would we would bring three people together uh, from different academic disciplines, uh, in in this case sociology, economics, and geography, and that we would sort of give a really high level, broad view of the academic discipline and its approach to studying energy development, and then provide one or two sort of recent um, examples of quality research that's been done within this academic discipline. And then we, we would sort of talk about some, some ways to integrate that research, some commonalities, synergies, opportunities for, for uh, coordination. Um, and the idea of the, of the discussion is really for it to be sort of a high level, um, broad overview discussion. Um, or sort of still at the beginning of this of this research coordination network process. Um, this is sort of meant to seed the discussion as we go forward. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about so the sociology and sociological discipline. Um, I think so sociology is a very broad field, and there's a lot of different people doing a lot of work in sociology, obviously. Uh, the, the Branches of sociology that have focused on energy development, I think, um, tend to be more of the rural um, sociology and environmental sociology. 
broadly speaking. And I think sociology is is very much uh, sort of obsessed with this process of modernization and urbanization, and and has been since the beginning of sociology, uh, you know, 150 years ago. Uh, and this sort of this idea of you know uh, society modernizing, of it urbanizing, um, and the effect that that transition of that, that process has on people and has on communities. And I think that's still, even today, a, a focus of, re of research on communities uh, impacted by energy development. Uh, there's still sort of a focus on how rural communities are being affected by this transition, about populations um, that are once homogenous um, becoming impacted uh, with this sort of um, heterogeneous uh, uh, influx of people, um, thinking about isolated communities becoming more integrated with uh, with industry and the economy, thinking about uh, agricultural based communities moving towards um, more industrial um, sectors. Uh, so, and you know, these are themes from 150 years ago, and I think these are still the main themes that, that drive a lot of sociological research in the energy, and that's not necessarily to say that that's the right way to go about it. Um, you can certainly criticize that approach. I'm just saying that that's sort of a general perspective on, on the way the discipline sort of approaches energy. Uh, there are, you know, so, so some of the key variables in this realm are sort of looking at effects on housing, on employment, on government services, on community quality of life, um, changes to how people socially interact, the changes to the way people, sort of the social order, how people, um, their roles and their identities in society and how that changes, um, what the, uh, the impacts, the costs or the benefits are strat stratified across different uh, classes in society. Um, and then thinking about the way that, uh, you know, this transition, uh, these impacts to these communities, how, you know, they're controlled, who has um, sort of control over this process, um, how are decisions made, who has access to this process, um, where are the levels of trust and um, opportunities for participation in this process. Not, then also sort of more long-term thinking about the resiliency of communities to weather these changes, uh, what are the long-term effects to community well-being from this sort of these, this, this um, transition or change that's wrought by um, you know, energy development by long-term by sort of large-scale energy industry moving into smaller communities. Uh, that isn't to say that there aren't other sociological approaches. I mean, people have looked at sort of gendered effects of developments. Um, some people are trying to, to fit these, these uh, small communities, the local level, fit that within a larger sort of global scheme of, of energy, of the energy economy. Um, there's so, some approaches to, to studying this that are much more critical, um, looking at you know sort of a neo-Marxist perspective that really looks at the, the different classes, divides the, the means of production, this idea of a, of a treadmill of production when you're talking about resource extraction and so on. And then also um, you know, people that are looking at not so much the communities that are being impacted, but people that are work, looking at the workforces and, and the, the workers that are part of this industry um, and, and thinking about the, the, the transition from the perspective of the industry and, um, and the commodity change. Um, I would say in sociology that there is an intense focus on measuring attitudes, um, and this is surveys and interview research and focus groups and going into communities and talking to people and uh, doing surveys. Um, and I think there's multiple rationale for why this is a focus. Um, I, for, for, uh, at, you know, to some extent, perception is reality, and so if people feel a certain way about something that they're socially constructing um, the situation to be a certain way, then you know, in a lot of cases, that that's sort of how it becomes, and that's how people act and how you know they behave is based on their perceptions. Uh, it's also true that you know, especially in places impacted by um, shale energy, that information is really hard to come by. Um, government statistics on say cost of living or uh, expenditures or you know uh, hospital admissions all these different factors are, are the data is really hard to, to, to come by but it's it's a lot easier to mail people a survey and have them fill it out and see what they think um, and it's also sort of easier to play around with that data and sort of perform experiments where you say oh let's look at people who are young and see how they filled out the survey versus people who are older and to do sort of experiments 
Um, and so perhaps there's too much of a focus on, on attitudes, um, but I think that is where a lot of the focus in sociology has been. I uh, just want to give a couple, um, I guess, shout outs to some, to some work that's been done. Um, uh, Felix Fernando, um, Dennis Cooley up in North Dakota have a series of articles actually, uh, one that just appeared in the Journal of Rural Sociology, um, looking at the, the Bakken oil shale and some of the social community impacts, impacts on housing that are, that's going up there. Um, this, this particular article really took a structural approach looking at the sort of the, um, uh, or a systems approach, looking at the, the system of the community and how it was impacted. Here's just uh, one example of, of some of the work they've done, just looking at the ways that the different types of uh, community attributes and the different impacts of the community sort of fit together and sort of some causal mechanisms in in how people um, are being affected by oil development in North Dakota. An another article, um, so actually a co-author on this, however, I played a very uh, small role. Um, Chris Clark at George Mason was, was uh, lead author and this looks at um, geographic distance from oil and gas development and sort of key finding is that uh, the further away you get from oil and gas, the more likely um, sort of these ideologies and these values are to uh, influence your perception of the oil and gas development. So basically, the further away you get, um, the further away you get, uh, whether you're a liberal or you're a conservative, will more likely to influence your perceptions. However, when you get close to the oil and gas development, whether you're a liberal or conservative, doesn't really seem to influence how you think about it, um, which sort of can forms to previous research that's been done on this issue, but um, but I think this is a, a much clearer example. Uh, so these are just a uh, couple couple examples of some sociological research and energy. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jeremy, who's going to talk about economics. I think, Jeremy, make sure your microphone is uh, turned on. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeffrey. Sociology, I think, complements economics well, though the complementarity maybe isn't always uh, leveraged, but it provide, certainly provides a lot of texture and, and detail to understand numbers that economists are often so obsessed with estimating, um, but maybe don't always have a great grasp of uh, what's driving those numbers or what it looks like uh, on the ground. Uh, but I'm going to take a very high level view of the key subfields or uh, areas of, that, that economists have been working in related to energy development. Uh, the first Oh, and I'll add that I'm from the University of Pittsburgh uh, in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs and also in the Department of Economics and uh, associated with the Shale Gas, Gas Governance Center of uh, the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Um, perhaps the most, these are the four areas that I'll highlight and talk about the key questions associated with each one of them and highlight a publication or a research in progress in each one of these areas. Um, the first one I'll talk about is labor markets, and that's the one that has received most attention by economists. It's one that is often at the center of attention for policymakers. The basic idea is that drilling more wells requires more people. And more people are required not just to drill wells, but then to man the hotels that those well drillers are staying in, or the restaurants, um, and so on. So that increased demand for labor increases aggregate employment. Uh, it can drive up wages and then attract a new population, uh, workers from elsewhere, and, and increase aggregate earnings overall. And depending on how much wages rise locally, uh, that can have 
additional consequences. So if wages rise generally across the economy and you're in a business that doesn't serve the industry or any related uh, activities, then you're paying more for your labor, but you're not getting more for your output, and that makes you less competitive. Um, likewise, if wages are rising primarily in lower or semi-skilled jobs, that can change whether or not people want to stay in school or uh, go to college. That's an area of research. Um, and then, of course, the wage gains might not be felt equally across the population, and so the distributional impacts are, are also of interest. Um, a co-author of mine and I recently reviewed a lot of this literature, uh, and it's um, in the publication literature is oil and gas, though we get into mining and, and coal um, as well. The other area is, is what I'll call social cost, or economists often use the word externalities, the externality language communicating the idea that there's a cost or benefit associated with a private actor's decisions, in this case the oil and gas industry, that it that the industry doesn't itself pay for, but but that is generated by its its activity. One of those or examples of those would be health risk or environmental degradation associated with development, um, that, that would be an external cost. Um, you could also think more broadly about effects on quality of life, um, criminality, or prostitution, that, that maybe the industry itself isn't responsible, but um, maybe its workforce uh, in some way contributes to. Um, similarly, Traffic congestion, a lot of truck truck traffic required. Uh, that's a cost that's using up uh, the roadways as a resource and making it requiring it more time to get from A to B. Uh, there's a paper out on increased track or, uh, traffic incidents as well in shale areas, and we can also think about disproportional use of public goods by the industry, and uh, the industry may not, in fact, be its share of its of that use. An example from this research or this line of research is uh, this article in the American Economic Review on the housing market impacts of shale development. Uh, and one thing that they did that was interesting there is look at the difference in the housing market effects based on whether the home was served by public drinking water or by well water. And they find that most of the uh, this, that there was a negative effect for houses served by well water, and there wasn't much of an effect for those that were served by public water. So uh, that may reflect a real risk associated with shale development or, or merely a perceived risk. But nevertheless, it was one that showed up in how much people were willing to pay for a house. Um, the third area is in public finances. So booms and busts in extraction can have a variety of effects on revenues and expenditures of both state government, but, but certainly also local institutions, such as schools, municipalities, or counties, um, depending on the tax policy of the area. The, the entire tax base might expand, uh, which could cause municipalities or, or governments to change tax rates. Uh, and then the, the net effect of all of this uh, on revenues could certainly be positive or, or negative. Um, the state could be getting more money and decide to transfer that to areas experiencing development. Um, school finances is where a lot, a lot of research happens in the general economics literature, but uh, there's some starting to happen as people understand the links between energy development and, and, and school resources. And then, of course, public expenditures can also be changing for things like roads and police. Um, and a nice overview, nice descriptive piece 
understanding the different local government implications or the implications of shale development for local government revenues and costs uh, is this paper here by Richard Newell and Daniel Ramey. Um, lastly, uh, our issues related to resource ownership. Um, that uh, there are several questions related to resource ownership. For the first being, fundamentally, uh, who owns the resource then is the person deciding Rendering into the negotiation of what are the terms uh, under which extraction will occur. Uh, so some related questions is, is who owns the resource, local residents versus absentee residents? Uh, what is the nature of those lease contracts? Who's bearing what risk uh, and reward? Uh, how competitive are leasing markets? Consequently, those subsurface resources can have effects on, on, generally speaking, land values or housing values, and then, of course, the wealth of the people who own them. Um, and lastly, when, when drilling happens or prices expand and the value of those subsurface assets increases um, and potentially generates more cash or just simply a higher wealth, how do people respond? Are they saving a lot of that revenue? Are they spending it on fast cars and great cruises or buying new tractors, whatever? Uh, and a, a recent paper by myself and co-authors was looking at how competitive uh, markets for oil and gas rights was, whether or not people who owned rights in areas with more productive wells were in fact capturing a larger share of the value of production. Um, and I'll end there and pass the baton over to Julia. Hi. Um, thank you both for those great overviews. I think we see, we'll already see that there's just a lot of um, overlap in the fundamental questions that we're asking. I wanted to just note that um, geography is, like Jeffrey said, you know, very large field. Um, and we have, even energy geography is um, a very broad field. We do have an energy um, and environment specialty group through the American Association of Geographers. Um, and there is a sort of emerging cohort of political ecologists focused um, on energy. And they meet every February. Um, at the political ecology meetings. Uh, and geography is a broad field. I want to just draw immediate attention to the notion that um, community focused research as a focus of resource geography or energy geography is not altogether celebrated by um, geographers. So I have some language here. Um, from a recent paper seeking to chart kind of new terrain and theoretical geographic perspectives on energy development. And this raises attention to the idea that geographers, many geographers feel like we've got to get out of continually studying the local, um, the sort of ideographic, and really focus on how you connect these holes of extraction um, to sort of big picture issues around the political economy, geopolitics, um, commodity chains. So Jeffrey uh, alluded to this as well. Um, I would say that sort of place-focused energy research um, is maybe not considered to be the sexiest theoretical topic in geography, but nonetheless, we do bring some pretty um, good tools to this question. So broadly speaking, some of the questions that we ask about energy and place or energy and community um, can be described this way. Who cares about this place? Why do they care about it? And, and particularly, how does development change the place? Who are winners and losers in energy development? And, from a geographic perspective, where are they? Uh, who is it that gets to say that development is appropriate or suits a particular place? Um, and what are the processes, not only social processes, but also material or physical processes that resist or enable development? Um, and then lastly, is sort of in the planning and governance space, geographers are interested in asking how a community gets to where they are with respect to resource development um, and what kinds of processes govern where they're going. 
um, oh, we're missing a slide. So um, within this space, we do have um, an important set of tools that we bring to this. These are tools that are kind of unique to geography, uh, both conceptual and sort of applied tools. So we're very interested in questions of space and scale. We use GIS and mapping in a lot of our work. Um, we're very interested in integrative approaches, so how the material, so the environmental or industrial infrastructure, actually intersects with cultural and political dynamics. Um, and then from a methodological standpoint, geographers uh, rely on participatory mapping, ethnography, policy analysis, surveys, archival research. We really are um, kind of an eclectic group in that way. So I just highlighted a couple of examples. Um, this actually is not from shale development, but it's the best graphic to go on a slide. But uh, this is an example of using participatory mapping to think about patterns of place and place attachment and how our offshore development on Sakhalin Island. Um, but I, I use this to emphasize the contribution made by participatory processes and an emphasis um, in many geographers that are interested in looking at underserved communities in conducting research in participatory ways and research that has a focus on benefits back to um, the community. And this particular map, I believe, is based on about five or six um, separate sort of long field seasons. So this is work that is um, slow, highly um, sort of resource intensive of the individuals conducting this resource, but also really focused on um, the benefit of the process of research to um, energy host communities. So we see some really exciting work um, happening at the intersection of thinking about the distribu distributive justice issues and, and participatory governance kind of issues and these issues of cost and benefit that Jeremy alluded to. I'm highlighting here some work coming out of um, Matt Fry, who has been looking um, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area at the Barnett Shale using um, appraisal values, appraisal data, um, to look at costs and benefits, but then to map that um, against the patterns of energy development, and then to go further and ask about um, participation in governance. So in this particular study that uh, you see here in ecological economics, they used appraised value of mineral properties um, to help understand who owns mineral rights and how this pattern of ownership relates to who's living near drilling sites. So what they can say from that is who's really bearing the costs and then um, who is sort of um, who and where are the benefits accruing. And in this work, they show that just 16% of all the mineral interests, so these are non-working mineral interests in this um, particular municipality, um, are local. And of those non-local working interests, um, more than a third are located outside of Texas, and a half are um, in the greater, in the city or greater um, area. So what they can conclude from this is that there really is a disproportionate distribution of the burdens um, and benefits with respect to um, non-mineral resident owners paying a lot of the potential environmental and health risks without receiving um, direct economic benefits. So this is, I think, the exciting kind of thing that can happen when you begin to integrate these tools and these scalar um, perspectives. I myself come from a background about this last question of, you know, sort of how do we get there and what happens once we get here and um, work with other geographers who are interested in sort of how communities respond to um, this idea that there really is not much of a strong planning um, or impact assessment mandate in U.S. policy. And so how do we think about how host communities can actually measure impacts, how they assess impacts, how they mitigate them? Um, what does that cost communities, not only in terms of just um, the monetary cost of mitigation and whether or not revenue is adequate to that, but in terms of um, the social and sort of political capital that goes into designing effective solutions um, in this space. And I would just say as a general rule, what we see almost across the shale landscape is um, that planning responses and impact assessment responses happen very much in an ad hoc fashion, and that can um, engender real creativity at the local level, uh, but often is sort of uh, hampered by not existing in a space where there's kind of the rules of the game or a meta governance solution that ensures that um, 
these communities have adequate resources to actually respond to um, and plan for energy development. And I would say, um, so the sort of whole goal of our uh, coordination network and some of the conversations that we've had going into it was this idea that we want to make sure we're not um, missing opportunities to learn synthetic or consistent messages across communities. But one of the things that has really become increasingly clear to me the more work I do, especially comparative work, um, is this role of geography. And it's a very basic observation, but I think an important one, and this idea that um, there will always be a very localized nature of the impacts of shale development. Um, and so the more perspectives we bring in and the more um, diverse kinds of tools we use to examine local impacts, we may just find that we're looking at an increasingly complex kind of matrix, but not necessarily getting to a single set of arguments about what shale um, development does to communities. And I think that's an important um, sort of taking off point. I wanted also to note that one of the things that's emerging um, or a geographic perspective encourages in thinking about community impact is this, this need to begin to scale up um, to think across time and also across space. And here I'm highlighting the work of my colleague uh, Brady Allred, who is a landscape ecologist, but has done some of the first really important work at telling cumulative impacts um, at, uh, on a land use scale. Um, for oil and gas, but this is a reminder that um, we need to really think about legacy impacts, we need to do research that extends beyond the kind of boom period, um, and that we need to, as much as we respect local diversity, also work to kind of uh, think across um, scales of impact. I want to also just um, offer an observation that occurred to me as I was putting these slides together, which is this idea that a lot of the exciting work happening in energy geography much more broadly is a push to really understand um, the ways that energy infrastructure and energy resources facilitate a way of living in space. So um, the ma massive push towards urbanization that Jeffrey mentioned as a defining feature in sociology, geographers are interested in that just as, as a pattern of where people are and where resources go. Um, and so one way you can think about community impacts of energy development is to sort of flip it on its head and say that energy development actually makes um, a lot of communities possible. It, it defines patterns of mobility and it defines kind of patterns of place. Um, and so one question might be whether or not we want to be in dialogue with work that thinks along those lines um, and to think about community impacts in that sense in the way that energy systems transform um, patterns in how we live and how we move as part of the energy impacts dialogue. So these are some thoughts that we had about just um, Jeremy and Jeffrey and I as we put together these overviews of our fields. Um, these are some thoughts we had about immediate opportunities or um, points of conversation uh, that have to do with where our there may be some synergies or things to pursue. And that is clearly this issue around integrating it across scales. Um, so can we synthesize and aggregate community information uh, to some benefit, to some new insights? Secondly, do we have good, accurate data? Um, I think across our fields, you see this issue of battling against data privacy challenges. So the, the work that I mentioned that Matt Fry's been able to do um, in Texas, it might not be possible in a state where that level of um, access to assessor information um, might be more protected. And um, thinking about mapping and modeling as opportunities to aggregate and analyze across different data sets. So um, the values data set that, that Jeffrey talked about, some of the um, income or job data sets that Jeremy mentioned. Um, and some of the sort of spatial data sets that we have, that these maps or models might be a good opportunity to do that. Um, and then lastly, I think um, we have plenty of research to begin to make a strong, clear set of recommendations um, that would upgrade policies that affect communities. And I don't really see that um, clearly coming out of any of our fields yet. Um, and it's something potentially that this research coordination network might want to think about doing. 
Um, so with that, we will, we have a small group of um, dedicated audience members, um, but I thought before we took some questions, it'd be good to um, ask Jeremy and Jeffrey if just in the course of listening to this, they have um, other thoughts about interesting points of um, integration, points of difference, uh, other things that came out of our conversation so far. I would, so this is Jeffrey, um, I mean, I think just looking across the, uh, I mean, it's interesting because they are, you know, all three sort of talks talking about the same topic, um, except they're sort of three diff different uh, approaches. Uh, um, looking at economics and sociology, for example, I mean, just the externalities section that um, Jeremy had discussed, I mean, that's sort of, in some ways, I mean, it, it's it's sort of bread and butter sociology. Um, however, I, I think sociologists don't really think about um, those externalities as part of this larger system of, of you know, the sort of the energy industry and energy, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, commodity. Um, they just think of you know these these impacts to communities as bad. They don't think of them about it as in this sort of more holistic fashion that um, that perhaps economists do I, I'd be curious if um, you know so there is a ton a ton of sociological research on impacts to communities I wonder if um, I mean is that the research that sociologists collect or the data that um, or research that sociologists perform or the data that sociologists sort of collect on these community impacts or if those are useful to economists, to think about these externalities or if that data needs to be um, sort of collected and analyzed um, in, a, in a much different way to think of it more in this sort of uh, this larger macro level perspective, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I see sociological approaches that more of a, let's say, case study uh, focus on understanding very well from start to finish in one particular community's experience or um, you know, one landowner's experience um, or a handful of case studies or something like that is extremely useful because economists have this tendency to want to estimate one effect for all places in all time, uh, you know, what is the employment effect of an extra well, or you know, what is the effect of an extra well on, on school revenues. And the reality is that um, that might, if you don't understand how places are different and policies are different and people are different, you might end up smashing together a lot of different um, uh, a lot of different effects into into one effect and and think that you're capturing some sort of universal effect when really you've combined together um, very different effects and now are, are somewhat misrepresenting um, or, or oversimplifying your experience. I'll give one concrete example. Um, so looking at the housing value effects of shale development. Well, if you try to estimate a national effect by looking across, let's say at the county level, all counties in the US that had shale development or all zip codes or whatever, um, that would be mashing together probably some places where it had large positive effects and some places where it had large negative effects. You might find then that the average effect is zero and suggest, and then communicating that finding suggests that on average um, there is an effect, there, is, there isn't much of an effect on housing values when in fact what you've done is you've combined a positive effect with a negative effect. Now why would there be a positive effect in one place and a negative effect in another? Well, imagine one place oil and gas wells are taxed as property and so expanded drilling means 
more revenues to the school and lower property taxes, two things that tend to be highly uh, major factors in driving how much people are willing to pay for a home. In the next state over, oil and gas drilling may add nothing to the local tax base and just uh, cause some degradation in the quality of life so that uh, on average the effect there is negative. Um, so unless economists are reading about experiences in, in specific places and, and understanding the texture and how they're different, they're going to be estimating numbers that don't apply to anybody. Uh, I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I would um, appreciate those comments, Jeremy, and I, I guess what I'm hoping for in this space is that we do have so much data and information emerging, so much case study material, um, and I'm not sure if, if the econometric approach can help with this or how we get our heads around this, but I wonder if we're at a place where we can begin to tease out at least what some of the key variables are, so rather than looking for an answer you know, universally across to, to give your, you know, to follow on your example, this idea that one well is worth whatever it is, so many extra jobs, so many extra tax revenue, you know, so many costs, um, that we might think more sort of in a qualitative sense or in a sort of, um, I like to think about a vulnerability matrix. What are the driving factors that create certain kinds of vulnerability or opportunities? You know, clearly some of those we already know about, um, for example, what is the mineral ownership regime relative to the surface ownership regime and whatnot? Um, but you know, we begin, we tend to discover those things um, on a kind of case by case basis. And one of the things that our network might be able to do, um, or we might be able to direct some research in this direction moving forward, is just to begin to distill out of these case studies some of the sets of conditions that appear to be. Um, likely to set you up for certain kinds of vulnerabilities or opportunities. And, um, you know, as I said before, I, my sense is that we probably have enough data to do that. Um, but it, this is something that would definitely take collaboration. Well, uh, this is Mark. I, I thought I'd uh, just interject here um, in the remaining minutes of, of our webinar and just invite um, the participants to um, ask any questions uh, via the chat session down below. Uh, Jeffrey has uh, made a suggestion there as well. Our, so if there are any questions, that would be great. We could try to answer them in the next few minutes. I also have a question, but maybe I'll hold off and, and see what the, uh, the uh, participants have to ask as well. I see Georgia is typing. While we're waiting for Georgia's question, um, I was just going to ask uh, the three of you, um, you know, the, the shale boom that occurred, uh, as, as I understand it, was largely, um, at, at least in recent times, driven by um, the low interest rates and expansion of credit into that, in that area. And most of the um, global increase in energy production over the past number of years has been because of increased U.S. shale. Um, uh, and, and production, and so I, you know, and, and now we have this sort of what appears to be a glut and very low prices, and energy companies are sort of reeling back and trying to figure out how to handle the debt. So you know, we're focusing on community, and so we had the boom, and we have all these challenges associated with the boom, and now we have the bust. And I, I just was wondering if you might comment on that. And you can hold on that and answer George's question first. I just thought I'd throw it out there. I would add, respond to this question by saying uh, they don't much, um, though this research coordination, coordination network is meant to provide us space where more of that interaction can happen. Um, and to the extent that a geographer sends a paper to a, a journal that I'm, uh, or cites something that I've done, then I might have the opportunity to review the work and in that sense I get exposed to it. But 
outside of those types of things, there, I don't think there's a lot, a lot of work together happening. Though I certainly don't have, uh, I have just my experience to draw from. Um, so this is Julia. Thank you for your question, Georgia. I am part of a um, some funded research that that includes um, economists and a geographer, uh, geographers, and we find it pretty easy to work together. Um, and I would say that if you so there's like a lot of seamlessness in geography with respect to where we publish and what we read and what we integrate into our work. Um, so we're uh, really dispersed. So I was putting together, you know, my thoughts on this and looking at some of the most recent publications. And actually, a lot of them are by geographers, but not in geography journals. Um, so we are pretty good integrators in that sense. And I would guess that our the limits on collaborating to date have to do with the difficulty of raising adequate grant money to fund different researchers in different locations. And that's because it's unlikely, and these are emerging, Jeffrey, I think, is part of a, you know, an emerging cluster of expertise at Ohio State across disciplines um, in shale development and brought more broadly community impacts of energy development. But to date, it's been hard to find that whole slew of experts at one university. Um, and then splitting up the money and splitting up the resources just creates some coordination challenges that are maybe larger than the amount of money that is available through most funding sources to do that. So I think that that is a barrier. Um, and I'm maybe not the best example, but I'm, I do go to different meetings um, and read different literatures. If, if I could just mentioned, I think, to maybe echo what um, Jeremy was saying, which is that I think that the, given that there's a lot more interdisciplinary journals out there, such as energy policy, and uh, there's energy research and social science, there's nature energy, that I think, you know, given forums like, like these journals, that people are exposed to research done in other disciplines more than they were before. However, there still isn't that actual working together on the research um, as there is just sort of more of the cross exposure. So I think there's, you know, I think that, you know, just the differences in the approaches that we just talked about here kind of shows that there probably would be or that there, you know, that there are advantages to having people from across disciplines work on a, on, on a singular project. Um, and Mark, you might have to repeat the question that you had asked uh, a while back. Uh, sure. I um, well, thank you, Georgia, for that that great question and the and the feedback there. Um, I, I was just thinking about sort of linking the community impacts um, of shale development with sort of the broader financial environment. You know, we have this record low interest rates, uh, flow of hot money into um, shale development, and then we have uh, what appears to be a glut um, in global oil supply or petroleum supply, and now energies are, are falling, and these energy companies in turn have to cut back production, so we have a bust. They have trouble paying off uh, debt, at least some of them are, which then comes back to affect the financial institutions. I, and I'm just sort of thinking about, you know, is that, a, 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 in a sense, an externality of our uh, the way in which we conduct monetary policy and credit expansion? Um, I don't think so. I think it's more related to just the characteristics of energy markets. If interest rates were higher and you introduce a new technology, in a time of high prices, there's going to be a large expansion in the uncoordinated and how the scale of that expansion, um, how, how effective that new technology is, is not going to be well known by any one actor. And so if they overshoot, and produce a lot, 
and demand for energy tends to be very inelastic in the short term. So you bring a lot of production on the market and the price has to go down a lot to clear it. So then people pull back drilling and in the long term actually demands much more elastic will respond. Anyway, these characteristics I think are, are, are just intrinsic to uh, the nature of the market and not driven by whether interest rates are at 2% or 4%. Okay, so they're just not terribly uh, sensitive to that those low interest rates. Then um, is that what you're saying? I'm saying that that's going to be a variable that affects the things on the margin. You know, there's always going to be be an area in the play that's not profitable at the current price or cost. But if you changed rig rates or uh, you changed gas prices or oil prices just a little bit, then a few more wells become attractive to drill. So interest rates can affect that, um, but they're not going to drive something like uh, a disruptive technology that comes onto an industry is is a is a different thing than a tweak in uh, the cost of a key input, say labor or capital. Okay, thank you. If I could maybe jump on there from a slightly different perspective. I mean, I think it, it raises this larger question of, you know, what uh, continued or expanded shale development is going to look like in the future. Um, you know, so we have this, like the past 10 years or so is sort of a recent history and will the next, you know, assuming that oil prices do rise, which it, um, or energy prices, which it seems like that they are, or they will eventually, and certainly at some point, some you know they will. Um, so it's sort of what what will shale development look like? And I, you know, I, I wonder how much of the of our recent experience was driven by, by the fact that you sort of had uh, this you know frenzied expansion into a new market, basically um, sort of a land grab, and you had um, companies and firms you know competing against each other to prove the resources to show their investors that they have uh, you know x amount of reserves that are that are um, you know possible for development and so on and that once that sort of initial frenzy of competition is once the you know the parameters are, have been defined basically that um, that um, development will be sort of much slower moving I guess in in um, and gradual, but um, that's just my own two cents. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Well, we, we probably have time for one more question, and I think we have to find a way to conclude here. I see Kristen Smith is typing a question. Maybe we'll make that our last. Uh, so she's asking, uh, can talk about the goals for for July's Energy Aid probably symposium um, in Columbus. Um, so that's a great question. So I think the 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 way that the the symposium was envisioned when we when we envisioned it a couple years ago was that it'd be just sort of sort of a a space, a clearinghouse for people of all different stripes looking at energy development from a from a social science perspective. Um, that they could come together and share their research and, you know, have lots of time to interact with one another and to be exposed to different types of research. Um, and not to say that there wouldn't also be uh, a benefit for, um, for, you know, practitioners or extension personnel or, you know, people who work in the, in the industry or are impacted by industry but aren't social scientists, that they would also have a, a value for attending. And so it was sort of envisioned as this, you know, ground for uh, cross-pollination across these different disciplines. Um, the uh, there is we, we do have some funding, and we're, and we're working to get additional funding to bring people there. I think there is a, a focus that we want to bring uh, a healthy number healthy number of, of graduate students to to attend the symposium, and also we're hoping to bring a, a healthy number of people from sort of. Uh, Underrepresented groups, um, whether that be sort of geographies or disciplines or race ethnicities, to attend the symposium as well. Um, Julie, I don't know if you want to add anything on the goals for the symposium. Sure. I mean, those are I would describe all of those as objectives, right? What are what's going to happen there? 
um, how it's going to happen. I think the goals are really to um, to push forward to some new conceptual framing, some new discoveries, some new insights about um, the impact of energy development, whether it is with respect to the kinds of data we should collect and how we should use it or how we should think about these impacts. And I think that's only possible when you bring together people from uh, different disciplines. And there is, you know, the, the other side of it is like, to think about the future research agenda in this space in ways that um, minimize redundancy, you know, so not to be hyper efficient, but, you know, to think about the fact that there is a problem with um, some people sort of repeating studies in different disciplines uh, that are so similar that it's hard to see sort of what's original about them. Um, so how can we begin to really think about the opportunities for, for new insights that come from thinking across these disciplines? So. Um, we expect that what we'll find um, at this conference is some of the best um, and most exciting presentations in new research in um, community impacts, but that we've really focused uh, the format of the meeting and some of the invited speakers on the ability to synthesize and really push conceptual frameworks um, and methodologies. Well, okay, I think that's a, a good spot to, to end the webinar on. Um, Jeff has um, made a note in the chat session, just a reminder that the recordings of the webinar will be posted um, both here at the NCRCR. Julia. Um, for the presentation. Really great. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks again to all the support that the North Central Regional Center has provided our group uh, even, be, you know, long before the the uh, Energy Impacts RCN was a reality, so really appreciate it. And we've, uh, we're putting together the uh, the speakers for the next um, webinar on, on December 15th. I think we have them all lined up. We just have to cross a couple of T's and dot to my's and, and we'll announce those uh, very shortly. Uh, so thanks. Okay. Well, thanks again and thanks to the participants as well. Have a good afternoon. Have a good afternoon.